I just finished reading the new biography of Elon Musk by Walter Isaacson. Love him or hate him, Elon Musk seems to be everywhere these days with a hand in everything. He's the richest man in the world, with an estimated net worth of between $226 and $249 billion, depending on who does the estimating. And between Twitter, now X, OpenAI, X.AI, The Boring Company, Tesla, SpaceX, and PayPal, if he doesn't touch something that you use on a daily basis today, he will in the near future, especially if he gets his way. How has one man at the age of 52 already accomplished so much? Why does his success bother so many people? And what the heck is his fascination with the letter X? I never did get the answer to that last question, by the way. I never considered myself a Musk super fan or a hater. And while my thoughts in this video might come across as a criticism, I'm coming at it from the angle of trying to understand him. His success is astonishing, and with several more years of productive work ahead of him, he may one day top the list of other controversial industrialists like John D. Rockefeller and Andrew Carnegie. Carnegie used to do things that you would totally believe Musk would do. He would tear down a freshly built steel plant just because he figured out he could build a better one. But for all that gusto, there's always been something about Musk that rubbed me the wrong way. And I couldn't put my finger on it until now. How has Elon Musk done so much already? He's an ass. Why does his success bother so many people? Okay, obviously there's more to it than that, but it really does seem like that's been a major factor in his success. Elon's kind of a man-child who throws tantrums until he gets his way. He's got screw em all evil dictator money, and he's a master at controlling the narrative. He never really seems to consider the alternative view that he might be anything less than completely correct, at least at first. And that confidence makes him bold, bold enough to take big risks, big risks that happen to have paid off. Isaacson followed Elon Musk for years and he gets right into it. Musk had a difficult childhood. He was bullied by his peers as well as by his father. The emotional and physical scars of his upbringing in South Africa seem to have affected his entire worldview. His father was volatile. One moment he'd be charismatic and fun, the next he'd be possessed by conspiracy theories and become verbally abusive. As one of Musk's wives later said, if your father is always calling you a moron and an idiot, Maybe the only response is to turn off anything inside. He learned to shut down fear. Regardless of how we got that way though, Musk was clearly driven to do big things and had a healthy disregard for what others considered impossible. But he never would have had a chance to do everything that he's done if it weren't for four factors. First of all, he was in the right place at the right time and was smart enough to see it. He recognized the challenge and promise of the internet revolution, so instead of pursuing a PhD at Stanford, he founded an internet company, Zip2, at the start of the internet revolution and sold that eventually to Compaq for enough money to be able to invest in other companies. That seed money gave him the capital to found online bank X.com, which merged with Confinity and later became PayPal. And although Musk's contribution to PayPal's eventual success is kind of murky given that under his leadership, they suffered from technical problems and lack of a discernible focus. And actually it was Peter Thiel and Max Levchin who chose to focus on money transfer and the PayPal service. Despite all of that, given that Musk was PayPal's largest single shareholder when eBay bought the company, he walked away with some $250 million a hundred million of which he rolled into founding SpaceX. The contacts and cachet he made at SpaceX brought him into the orbit of the other Tesla co-founders and things continued to snowball from there. Second, question everything. Musk questions every cost, every requirement and instructs those below him to do the same. In many cases, this has resulted in huge savings. Instead of paying $2 million for cranes to lift their rockets onto the launch pad, SpaceX's cranes only cost $300,000 to build because they were able to get a bunch of obsolete requirements waived. Musk insists on having an actual name attached to every requirement. It's not enough to say engineering required this or it's part of the military specification. He needs you to tell him exactly who set the specification and why. There is only one law and that's the law of physics, according to Musk. Everything else is just a suggestion. Musk thinks about the product he's developing itself and also how it'll be made, sold, used, installed, and so forth. He relentlessly pursues optimization, repeatedly deleting unnecessary steps, parts, and requirements. One of the maxims in his so-called production algorithm is, delete any part or process you can. You can add them back later. In fact, if you don't end up adding back 10% or more, then you didn't delete enough. Musk seems to disregard expertise, both to his credit and his detriment. Unencumbered by prior experience, he's free to invent the best way he can think of to do something. But that also means he and his team frequently have to reinvent the wheel. Rather than hiring industry experts who understood quality and manufacturing at Tesla, he decided he could engineer the vehicle manufacturing process better himself 
And then he was surprised when Tesla didn't turn out cars with panel gaps and fit and finish that rivaled the best European cars. Now they figured it out pretty quickly, but I found myself wondering how much time, energy, and money could have been saved if they'd spent a little bit of time up front understanding how and why the best companies did what they did before declaring that they could do it better. Third, focus. Musk is focused with almost laser-like intensity on his mission to save humanity. Never mind whether we actually need saving or not, Musk has decided that we do and that he's the man to do it by turning us into a multi-planetary civilization. In the 90s, Musk figured he'd focus on three things that would greatly affect humanity. The internet, sustainable energy, and space travel. And if his career history is any indication, he's pretty much stayed true to that mission all along. Focus has clearly been Musk's superpower, not just in his own ability to do it, but in his skill in getting others to do it as well. Now you could be excused for thinking with all his disparate endeavors that Musk actually lacks the ability to focus, but within each arena, he rarely strays from the mission. Musk is convinced in a sense that humanity is doomed and that our best hope of survival is to become a multi-planetary civilization. Whether it's global climate change, nuclear war, or an asteroid hitting the planet, according to Musk, some factor will eventually threaten our existence. And if we've colonized Mars, perhaps we have a chance of survival. That's the ultimate goal behind SpaceX. Every decision, every launch, every reusable rocket booster is focused on moving us toward that goal. Tesla is focused on the other side of the equation. Assuming humanity may be doomed, what can we do to minimize the damage and make sure the future is as bright as possible? Switching from a mine and drill methodology to one where energy is made, stored, and used in a renewable fashion is huge. So is reducing traffic fatalities, creating human tight AI models, and so forth. Despite his habitual willingness to set physically impossible goals, get far ahead of himself, and create crazy for everyone below him, Musk's wild ideas are usually paired with some sort of business model that actually moves him closer to where he dreams he'll be. Starlink Internet will fund SpaceX's Mars aspirations. Development of the Model 3 and Model Y was funded by the Tesla Roadster and the Model S. Getting to the mass market was always the goal. And again, Musk focuses on his end goal. Lastly, urgency. The high stakes game of saving humanity has created a sense of urgency in everything Musk does, essentially putting him and everyone around him into fight or die mode 24 seven. So much of his success and ability to manifest it seems to come from being in that fight or die mode to the point that he manufactures crises to keep himself motivated and engaged. When times are good, he feels aimless. When they're bad, he's energized with purpose. As Isaacson writes, Musk sets unrealistic timelines that transform his wild notions from being completely insane to being merely very late. And those timelines and existential crises, whether manufactured or not, force everyone to be on their A game, or as Musk has called it, hardcore. You could certainly argue that without a sense of urgency, there's too much of a chance for thought to turn into inaction. And Musk believes it's important to take action now, fail quickly, learn from it, and move on rather than drawing it out. But that maniacal sense of urgency has also been called his biggest weakness. Steve Jobs had a well-known reality distortion field around him, similar to the one that Musk continues to perpetuate. As one of his earliest SpaceX employees said, if you set an aggressive schedule that people think they might be able to make, they'll put in extra effort. If you give them a schedule that's physically impossible, you've demoralized them. So Musk has demoralized a lot of people. But for some, he's inspired them to do what others thought impossible, in less time than anyone could imagine, with less money than anyone has spent before. Why does his success bother so many people? Probably because he can be a bit of an ass. Maybe they're jealous, but mostly because he's an ass. This is not a revelation. If you've been watching Musk for long, you know that he can be mercurial, if not aggressively hostile and horrible. And while it's not the only component of play, the fact that he treats people so terribly is a major factor in why people have trouble with his success, including me. Fundamentally, I question whether he needed to be such a dick to everybody in order to achieve the success that he has. And sensing that it wasn't absolutely necessary, I further wonder why we've continued to reward him for his behavior. He's impulsive. You don't have to look far for examples of his problems with impulse control. His ex Twitter feed is full of them. In fact, just look at his purchase of Twitter itself. Beyond his impulsive offer to purchase Twitter seemingly without any due diligence or plan, once he owned the company, he decided he wanted to move a bunch of servers to a different data center to cut costs. And when the infrastructure team told him that doing the move correctly would take months, he got angry and took things into his own hands. With a small team and a fleet of moving vans, he yanked the servers out of that data center and later caused several extensive service outages. 
Eventually, he said he regretted that decision. Musk seems to lack the ability to process his emotions. And when he gets upset, apparently he impulsively takes his anger out on everyone around him, especially junior people. Isaacson recounts the story of a young manufacturing engineer named George Coffin, who fit the definition of hardcore. He'd been living out of a suitcase for the past 11 months, working seven days a week at the factory, when he was called out to troubleshoot a robotic arm that wasn't lining up. When he arrived, Musk just screamed at him, did you do this? And when he tried to understand what Musk was referring to, Musk fired him on the spot. He lacks empathy. When the Twitter acquisition was scheduled to close, a carefully planned ballet had been choreographed involving an orderly transfer of funds, delisting of the stock, and so forth on the day the deal was scheduled to close, Friday, October 28th. But that would have allowed the former Twitter CEO and other executives to collect severance and have their stock options vest, something that Musk did not want because that amounted to some $200 million in added costs that he thought he might be able to avoid. Instead, Musk and his advisors hatched a plan where they could force the deal to close at the end of the day on Thursday. And if they got their timing just right, they could fire the former chief executive and his lieutenants for cause, cheating them out of severance, and to do so before their stock options vested Friday morning. While it might be seen as draconian, Musk mentally justified shortchanging the executives who had shepherded Twitter into something he wanted to buy, by the way, because he believed he had overpaid. In some ways, I feel like Musk might relish his lack of empathy. There are stories recounted in the book where Musk laments the fact that one of his deputies couldn't fire someone or was too likable. To Musk, empathy is a risk, an impediment to doing what must be done. One of the corollaries to his production algorithm is indeed, camaraderie is dangerous. There's a tendency to not want to throw a colleague under the bus. That needs to be avoided. Isaacson says it best when he opines that Musk has an intuitive sense for engineering problems, but his neural nets have trouble when dealing with human feelings, which is what made his Twitter purchase such a problem. He thought of it as a technology company, when in fact it was an advertising medium based on human emotions and relationships. Clearly, Musk has a strong view of his own self-importance, and some of that is deserved, perhaps, given that his obvious contributions to the world are, say, bigger than mine. But that self-confidence bordering on egomania leaves him vulnerable to error. With his ego on full display, when ad revenue dropped 80% after he took the helm at Twitter, he blamed a conspiracy, never acknowledging or considering that he himself might be to blame with his erratic behavior on and off Twitter, amplification of debunked fringe theories, and resistance to moderation, all things that might make advertisers a little bit nervous. On that same ego front, he makes the mistake of thinking that problems he's previously solved make him the best man to solve other problems, ignoring the complexity of real-world situations that involve the interplay between human interaction and systems. As complex as launching a rocket into space is, it's mostly a physics design and engineering problem. When dealing with humans and systems that cross that line, such as Tesla full self-driving, the capabilities of which continue to be overstated, Musk seems to be at a loss. He's a bit of a hypocrite. There are numerous examples of Musk claiming to espouse some noble belief when his behavior says otherwise. A concept that comes up a couple times in the book is the fact that Musk would flash back to being bullied on the playground as a kid anytime things looked bleak, and that his obsession with total control might be one way he attempted to deal with that. For instance, in buying Twitter, now he could own the playground. But as others have pointed out, and I'll repeat here, owning the playground doesn't get you much. It doesn't prevent you from being bullied there. The most you can do, I suppose, is prevent people from coming to your playground, which seems to be exactly what Musk has done. After claiming to be a free speech absolutist, it seems like Musk is actually only a free speech absolutist when it comes to things that don't affect him or for things that he agrees with. What I think bothers people most of all, even if they can't put their finger on why, is the fact that Musk's ethics are relative and subjective. He takes a bit of an ends justify the means approach to things he does. Tesla autopilot accidents, for instance, are tolerable because they'll lead us to a greater understanding of how to avoid them in the future. Never mind that other drivers never consented to being lab rats in Musk's experiment. While those came from my interpretation of the book, I couldn't help but ponder other reasons Elon Musk's success might bother people so much. Reasons that have less to do with him and more to do with us. It could be that we're jealous, that he's been able to dodge obstacles that have ensnared so many of us. It could be that we feel like we're lazy by comparison, that his boundless dedication and productivity make the rest of us look bad. And it could be that we want more money just for the sake of having it, but don't want to admit it. What bothers you about Elon Musk? What do you admire and respect about him? Tell me more. I want to know in the comments below. If you have any interest, you should definitely check out Isaacson's new book. 
I came away with a much better understanding of the nuance involved in some of the highlights and the low points in Musk's history. Did it change my opinion of him? Not really. He's a brilliant, misunderstood thought leader who periodically shoots himself in the foot by his own admission. I respect the fact that he has the self-awareness to acknowledge he hasn't always helped his own cause. And most of all, I've come to appreciate the fact that with plucky grit and an uncanny sense of how to make an impact and control the conversation, he's been able to narrowly avoid defeat time and time again. It'll be interesting to see where he goes from here. Thanks for watching. Let me know what you thought. And until next time, we don't have a problem. We've got an opportunity.